So this is work in collaboration with, you can see, many friends and colleagues. And we've been looking at uh, reference pragmatics and theory of mind with the view of putting together a grant proposal. And I'll first I'm going to introduce some of those ideas that I'm in the process of trying to structure as a grant proposal. And then two studies. One is a cross-linguistic study looking at reference production in pigs and owls. And then it's a failed <laughs> speak up, speak up. Yeah. It's a failed theory of mind study which spent, explains why it's going to be a bit patchy because there was a very nice narrative linking all these together, but the results didn't turn out to be uh, what we expected and the connection between the studies might not be so obvious, but let's try. So, there was one. Yes. 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 Okay. So, I'm going to start with a fun because this talk really started in the first meeting in Flux a few years ago, where I presented, I gave a talk on reference and informativity, I was a guide to our colors. And I heard, you know, a number of talks and a number of discussions on language change, and I was very much, you know, impressed, it made a big impression on me to take that perspective. And I remember my Mercedes was saying, well, you're so curious, the challenge for you working on reference is to think that definite articles are commonly derived from demonstratives. That's a very common pattern. That means that a word like that would give rise to a word like the, meaning a word with a deictic function would eventually gain the status of a marker of definiteness. And in thinking and thinking, I came to think that maybe I would like to apply for some funding to investigate this change <laughs> seriously. And I went for a question that I've been, you know, toying and considering for a very long time, which is what's the relationship between pragmatics and theory of mind? And with pragmatics I've meant many things, just as it means many things. But in this case I was thinking of pragmatic markers, to give it a, a general term. The difference between we bought a house and we bought the house. When I say we bought the house, we're supposing there's a house we've been talking about before. And it's part of our common ground and I'm signaling that to you. So what, what goes in? What's, what's the type of theory of mind that goes into those markets? What are the implications? And six months after meeting in Flux 1, I went to Australia to give a talk at ANU, and I met Nick Evans. And I happened to be talking about this with the expert in the, in the room, it was really there. And Nick then told me about the work that they had just published on the grammar of engagement. So they opened the first paper explaining that human language offers rich ways to track, compare, and engage the attentional and epistemic states of interlocutors. And they define engagement as a grammatical system for encoding the relative accessibility of an entity or a state of affairs to the speaker and addressee. Now, it may sound complicated, but this is the kind of thing that we mark when I tell you we bought a house or we bought the house. Imagine a situation where I hadn't told you about the house and I came and told you, oh, by the way, we bought the house. You would immediately say, sorry, which house, right? So we are tracking knowledge, common ground, we are marking. And there are many different ways, by the way, engagement doesn't only limit, it's not limited to the noun phrase. There are entire verbal systems that have this type of meanings uh, incorporated. So we are fine-tuning the question, instead of pragmatics, perhaps we should talk about engagement. But the question is still really broad. There are many ways you could tackle this question, think of an ontological, uh, 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 a diachronic perspective, or a developmental perspective. And I think I would like to look at it from three angles. I would like to see how engagement markers are acquired by children, how they're used by adults, and how they're changed by generations of speakers. I know it's, um, it's going to be a challenge, but it's five years around, so let's try. So, the key notions, I'm not going to have time to link them, but you'll see roughly where it's going. The development at the linguistic level goes from demonstratives to anaphoric, demonstratives to definite articles, examples, look at that, pointing to an entity in the physical space, say that again, pointing at what we've just said in the conversation, and we bought the house, referring to that house I told you about six months ago. The interesting thing is that the diachronic development of these forms goes 
in that direction. In parallel, we've got pragmatic notions that, in a way, you are know, related to these forms, co-presence, borrowing verbs term, the discourse with anaphoric demonstratives, and common ground marking with definite articles. And there are also three key notions in theory of mind, but the parallels are not so clear, so I've left there a very safe gap. <laughs> but the abilities are joint attention, perspective taking, and epistemic reasoning. And the beauty is that if you look at the experimental record with um, toddlers and preschoolers, these abilities soon to build on top of each other, right? So they start with joint attention, with the use of demonstratives and pointing gestures, onto epistemic reasoning. Um, and around the age of four or five with the famous side. So these are the notions that I would like to be weaving into a, a narrative. And I think that the interesting question I would like to explore is a diachronic view of common ground. So if we think that a language has gone through this form of development from that as a dictic word to refer to the school present to a marker of definiteness, was changed in that language community was changed. And I think that what we see here is a shift in common ground. So what that presupposes is that the common ground is what's physically was co-present, what's the physical environment. When you say that again, your common ground extends not only to what's shared here in the immediacy, but with what you just said. And I could have told you about this house a year ago, and I'm still referring to it. So it's past shared experience. So what seems to be changing here is what um, what we are tracking, what we are keeping track of, what we consider common ground. And part of the beauty, I think, is that it's not just how diachronic changes uh, suggest that. It's that, again, the developmental record suggests that kids start putting a lot of weight on co-present, relying overly on what's co-present as a marker of what's common ground. And many of the errors, for example, that they make using definite articles come from uh, putting, again, too much weight on what's co-present and not understanding that when we're all in the same room, we don't all know the same, right? So I, I think there's a refining of what's common ground during development as well. So, I think that if we look at engagement across languages, it's obvious that there are going to be um, differences. So, not all languages mark definite articles. For example, the difference between I bought a house and I bought the house is only made in some languages. That means children are going to have different homeworks. Some kids, depending on the language they mark, they'll have to acquire evidentials, as in Japanese, or um, yeah, an indefinite marker in others. And what I'm interested in, since I'm coming to this more from a pragmatics point of view than a language point of view, is what difference do these cross-linguistic differences make to theory of mind development, right? And I want to give you a couple of examples. Uh, in English, we have two demonstratives, is this and that, marking normally distance for the speaker. But in Spanish or Japanese, we have three, este, ese y aquel. And the intermediate term is normally closer to the interlocutor, right? So it's closer to me as the speaker, closer to you as the interlocutor, farther away from the three of us, and the same is in Japanese, I believe. And that means a form of tracking space, the difference is this perspective taking that I had in the intermediate category in my table. There is some perspective taking that you have to do in Spanish, you may have to do in Japanese, that you don't do if you have just a true system. Um, so uh, think of another very interesting one, Turkish. They have two demonstrative forms to mark distance, equivalent to the this and that. But the third one, which is the one that is the hardest to acquire for a kid, tracks the attentional state of the speaker or the interlocutor. Only if you're not paying attention to what I'm pointing at, for example, would I use this to direct your attention. Once I see you've landed on it, I switch to the distance. Those take long to acquire because they are very subtle, you know, evidence that you are, when learning from others, these are very subtle cues. So, what is the effect of these differences? And so we run a very simple cross-linguistic study looking at Spanish, Romance language, with lots of speakers and written tradition, 
collected last week in Asturias, by the way, on my way, so I flew from Oslo, stopped home in Asturias, and came to Boston with the data <laughs> coding in the on the plane. It's fantastic. Mandinka, a Manda language with over a million speakers, no written tradition, collected in the Gambia last Christmas. Hindi, Indian language, over 320 million speakers, no written tradition, collected in New Delhi. And English, West Germanic language, 400 million speakers, written tradition, collected in Scotland, Edinburgh. And here I should thank my collaborators, my niece, Fatima Tanjalo, who helped me collect the data of the Christmas when we visited. In Banjul, uh, Marilon, my postdoc, was working in Edinburgh last year and also collected our data. And Vishaka Shukla, who works in New Delhi with Project Recash and collected the data there. So I want to, I had to, I think the, the case with Mandinka made me think hard about this because Mandinka is one of the languages that uh, Greenberg discusses in the, 19, the seminal 1978 uh, paper where he talks about uh, how the, the, the development of um, demonstratives into noun markers, into gender markers. You can see the development is marked on the left branch of the tree. And um, Mandinka had a demonstrative form that it lost over the game. definite article that it lost over use is an O, an O morpheme that simply marks, you know, is a, is a marks a lexicon. And thinking of how language, how um, pragmatics or engagement, if you like, could affect theory of mind, I think that thinking of language change is important because if we take this hypothesis too seriously, we are too Worfian. <laughs> we would have to predict that the Mandinka speakers went back when from a not so sophisticated theory of mind when they only had demonstratives to much more sophisticated theory of mind when they started marking common ground and uniqueness and then they lost all that when they overused it and they became, you know, less. So I, I think one has to be careful how to present these things. And so going back to the big question, I think that the idea is to look at engagement not, not as a manifestation of theory of mind ability, but as a manifestation of theory of mind use. And what I think these forms might do is that engagement might lead to the routinization, maybe even automatization of some forms of mind reading. So it could be that the Turkish kids eventually learn to in interaction be, you know, monitoring the interlocutor attentional state to see which form to use when they point, right? Without thinking about it as the beauty of it. So now onto the data. It's a very simple study. We showed kids vignettes and we were interested in reference to new and old characters. This would be a bunny living in her house. And 20 kids and 15 adults in each language would tell us what they saw and how the story continued. So we would be expecting things like there's a bunny and the bunny or she. Uh, it would be a bit weird, although it did happen, to say a bunny is leaving the house and a bunny is under the rain, because again, for us, that means we are presupposing they are, you know, we are assuming they are different bunnies. So it's an interesting question what these adults and kids do. And you can see in Mandinka, we were, it's the three, we've been monitoring the three most frequent differential forms, the bear down, uh, with the lexical marker O, the demonstrative, which is used for old, introduced old characters like a definite and pronouns. And you can see there's very little uh, variability. Most speakers, both adults and kids, use just the bear noun, both for new characters and old characters. Small variation in English, where we were looking at the use of the indefinite article, the definite article, and the pronoun. And we can see that both the kids, five year olds, and the adults, the university students, rely more on indefinite articles to introduce new characters and to refer to them later. And likewise, re reverse, <laughs> they use more the definite article for old characters than for new. Although there's a difference there between the adults and the children, adults tend to use more definite articles, the body, uh, for old characters, whereas kids rely more on pronouns. Now, Spanish has a similar system, only that we mark number and gender. And we see, again, it's a heavy reliance on the indefinite to introduce new characters. But um, for, um, 
um, all characters, there's uh, is the definite articles that is more frequently used, although, the, again, the kids um, seem to be using less. And it's interesting that both English kids use less definite articles than adults and Spanish. But the ki English kids use pronouns instead, whereas the Spanish kids do the pragmatically odd thing I told you about of using a bunny and a bunny again for the second drawing. So there's a difference there. Hindi, and this is the slide that I'm going to let, but I'm going to have to leave it because there's that. Vinita will be talking about this tomorrow, I'm guessing, so I don't know how much I dare to say, but <laughs> our adults, you can see this big difference there with the new characters. Um, Hindi has a numeral one that can be used uh, to, as an indefinite, right? So they don't mark, they don't have a definite and indefinite articles, but the numeral one can be used. And you can see that we see that used you know, very frequently in the adults, but not in the children. And one possibility is that our adults are students, uh, students of IIT who are bilingual, or I would say possibly bilingual in English, so we don't know from, from, from there whether it's influence of English or this could be an effect that is this, is this an indefinite in the making. I don't know, I think that, that question with you, but uh, we can see differences, although we, we have to collect more data with monolingual adults. But I think that all this colorful graph shows that there's a lot of variability, children have an easier or a more difficult task depending on what their language, uh, how their language marks definiteness, how specific the forms are. And what I was interested in is was to look at the effects of this variability on theory of mind. And this is a very simple task that I had designed a couple of years ago with Julian Paredinger who's here and Gary Chibra at CEU. And it's a task where we showed preschoolers, that makes me want to laugh, even how difficult it can have to be for the adults, that we tried with three-year-olds and five-year-olds. You can play with the duck, and the kids have to guess whether the girl knows there's a duck inside the box or not. And the catch here is that she did not use any modifier, so it seems to suggest she only knows about the duck on the table. Polish kids who were among the children who tested this particularly bad, you can see here, and we thought that perhaps the issue was with the fact that they didn't have, they don't have a definite article, right? So um, you and I were very excited thinking that it could be the ambiguity, right? So imagine this could be, it could be ambiguous between you can play with a duck, either of the two, or the duck, I only know about one. And it turns out that's not the case. It would have been really beautiful, as I said at the beginning, to connect the two, you know, to be talking about definite acquisition, definite acquisition on the one hand, and the kind of epistemic inferences you may derive uh, once you have those under your belt. But that's not the case. It turned out to be a hard task also for adults. There were two conditions you can play with a big thing, where the argument is that if she's saying big, she must know there's a small thing in the box, versus the unmodified, I've already explained. And there was a big, uh, among the adults, which is what I'm going to play, uh, present you now, there was a big block effect. Um, so if you hear the adjective first, you realize what it means not to use it afterwards and vice versa. So I'm only going to present data for the first block. They have you know, no, no other experience. And both Polish and English adults do above chance in the um, task with a big pig. And we are counting only correct responses, things like, of course, if she says big, she must know there's a small pig in the box. But the unmodified condition was really hard. We are looking at under 20% of correct responses. So it's not a matter of the inherent ambiguity in Polish because of the lack of a definite marker. English speakers who do mark definiteness are still completely lost in this, in this task. Those are Turkers and the Polish media. They are university students, but I am not sure that that explains anything. I think it's just a very hard task. How old are you? Sorry? Children. No, no, those are adults, those are adults. So these, these are adults. They, 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 we switched to adults to, to see oh, no, whether... Yeah. 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 So, um, so no, and I think that this, you know, this poor performance explains why children have such difficulties. So um, the last big open question, what drives some language communities but not others to develop a definite article from their demonstratives? To me, it's such a big picture. You have been studying reference in situ, as, as her was saying, for years. 
and the idea of moving from the here and now, the kind of factors that can affect you, to what we are all doing as we speak, literally, over years, is I get intellectual vertigo. So I put the question to Nick Evans, who came to Oslo the day before I went to Spain for my data, and said, Nick, is it just a cycle? Could we just think that these are cyclic forces? And he didn't like the idea. It was like, look, Paula, that presupposes some sort of inertia, and the right conditions need to be met. It's not that every language, every language has a demonstrative system, not every language will eventually develop a definite article. So what are the conditions? And that's, going back to his book, I found this one line, grammars routinized our most common and central communicative tasks. And now, I, you know, before I put together the grant proposal, the question is what we hypothesize those communicative tasks are when it comes to the definite article. So thank you very much, and special thanks to Maria and her group, and Julian Ferretti, who is also here. Thank you very much. <laughs>